Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Insider Transaction Data Set Challenge, a live tear sheet review and, and web winner announcement. Today's speakers are Dr. Thomas Wiki and Dr. Rene Zhang. Thomas Wiki is the VP of Data Science at Quantopian. He did his PhD at Brown University, building computational models of the brain. He is the co-author of the popular probabilistic programming package, Pi MC3. Rene Zhang is the director of data science at Quantopian. She holds a PhD in applied mathematics from Tufts University, specializing in tensor algebra, numerical analysis, and image processing. She joined Quantopian in 2016 and worked on building Quantopian risk model, feature factory, and statistical selection of trading strategies. There's a link to, this challenge, to the challenges forum post in the description of this webinar where you can ask any remaining questions to members of the community. Thank you so much, Thomas and Renee. With that, let's get started. Thank you so much for setting us up, Saba, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar where we will announce the winners of the Insider Transaction Challenge. I'm very excited about this challenge. Um, so. Uh, mainly because it was a new data set that we had on the platform, but also uh, because of the number of submissions we've gotten, the high quality number of submissions we've gotten, uh, and also that here there was a really proper holdout set of two years. So looking at the out of sample data, how it compares within the sample data will be really interesting, and uh, we'll go through that. Uh, most, uh, actually, the whole notebook was done by Renee, um, who I also have on this call here, so she will be able to uh, assist and correct me on anything dumb that I say. So, um, Renee, do you want to say hi to everybody? Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you and Thomas to talk about this uh, um, Insider Transaction Challenge. I also think uh, this is a very interesting challenge. Um, OK, um, yeah, um, I think uh, if you have questions, um, I will try my best to, to answer it. Also, Thomas can help me to answer them. Cool. So um, we'll do it like last time where uh, I show the analysis that we did. Um, well, yes. Uh, so we start with some stats, and then I'm going to show some, um, some tear sheets, and then we will dig deep into the analysis. Um, so I don't want to hold off on what uh, the points they want to make about explaining what the tear sheets look like. Um, so the high level summary of this challenge was that we had over 40 authors that submitted. Um, I think that's a new high watermark. So thank you for everyone who submitted. Uh, and overall, there were 160 submissions, which is also a new record. So um, really excited about that. And here is the number of submissions per user, uh, just as an overview. So your team knocked it out of the park with 19 submissions. That doesn't have to mean anything, right? It, a lot of people just submit the um, small updates of the same version, which is totally fine. Um, we, we, I think it's really interesting to see progression of factors. But I think Joachim actually had some different uh, submissions in here as well. Uh, but yeah, so definitely we see a lot of uh, familiar faces here. Um, but we also see a lot of new faces. So um, that makes me quite happy and uh, welcome everyone who submitted for the first time. So before going into the analysis, I do want to show um, just again demonstrating what, a, what the test sheet looks like and what we're looking for. This is the submission that people were supposed to make. Um, and you can see that the first plot is the main one that we're looking at, which has the IR or um, the sharp ratio you can think of, of the specific and the total returns. So specific return is after you take into account the risk, the common risk sources that you took on, things like volatility and short-term sector risk. So often we would look at the specific risk. And the key thing of this tear sheet is that we're not just looking at a single day, but we're actually looking what happens to a factor if the trading of that factor gets delayed by one to 14 days. So that is on the x-axis here. And the reason why that is important is that not always do you trade into the factor completely on the very first day. Depending on the turnover of the factor, that might incur really high transaction costs so you want to ease into a factor often and uh, due to turnover restrictions that you have on your overall portfolio. Right? 
So it's important that if you do incur that delay, that the alpha that you're trying to capture doesn't completely evaporate. And that is not the case here. So you can see over 14 days, it does go down as it usually does, and but not dramatically. So it doesn't, after the first day, just turn zero or negative. So that's really good. Um, then here on the right side, what we're looking for is just whether there are periods where the factor just didn't work at all. And here you can see um, that it has pretty steady performance. There are some drawdowns here, but um, I mean, this is difficult to, to do, so that is to be expected. And also, uh, we were well aware that the insider transaction data set was really challenging to work with. So it appeared that there just wasn't all that much alpha in there. And also, the, what we were able to do with it was also kind of limited. Um, so this was definitely a very, very hard challenge, but um, I think a lot of people stepped up to the challenge and some of the really good things. So, um, but nonetheless, so uh, this won't look as good as say the estimate challenge where um, it was much easier to come up with high alpha factors and there were also much more, um, the space of possibilities of what you could do was just much bigger too. So that is for total and specific returns. Then uh, here is the, the risk section, and I always make that point, and I'm going to make it again, that here we are not looking for just everything centered around zero. It's totally fine to have risk exposures and dip into risk sources. Uh, do not use the optimizer to constrain weight resources. Do not use alpha optimization or something else to regress that out. We want to see the factor originally um, we evaluate with a specific return, so we do not uh, we don't evaluate it based on any risk that you pick up, but that gives us the ability to do um, to squash the risk on our end. And often, what happens anyway is when we combine these different factors and they have all these different exposures, that the exposures average out. So in the final portfolio, there's just less um, to do in that regard. Um, so here it looks like it is fairly constrained, which is um, if the optimizer was used, that's not ideal. Um, so, but uh, but maybe not. Um, and then here you can see where the where the volatility and the cumulative returns come from. And then of course here also we have the plot that shows the turnover. Um, so here we asked for. Um, um, well, actually, uh, did we ask here for a minimum turnover? No, I think that was for the financial challenge. So overall, you do want some turnover, right? You want your factors to trade, but you also don't want it to be excessive. So the average here is um, on the low side, but there is definitely these spikes um, periodically, which is probably when um, the data becomes available or there is a new event, so that is, that's fine. But here, you can see during these spikes, that's where the delay will be incurred because um, the portfolio, the resulting portfolio wouldn't turn over 75% during these peaks, um, it will just slowly catch up over the next couple of days. And then here we have the number of holdings. Uh, so this is a large universe, and generally larger universes are better. It's harder to overfit on. It gives you more space to try uh, to, um, yeah, it gives you more ability to, um, to do things with a factor, right? So if it's only 10 names here and 10 names there, on, on the long and the short side, you can't really do anything with it. So that's why it's good to have optionality. And on our end, we could still reduce it to a certain size that um, makes it more comfortable. And then the last piece here is the long short percent holdings. And the different lines here represent the percentiles of the of the weights for every day. And as you can see, that there is a nice spread. So that is what we're looking for. If the portfolio ends up being equal weighted, which is often happening, if you over rely on the optimizer, then here you will see that um, these lines are just overlapping. So that means all the weights on the long and the short side are just squashed to be the same value. And also so that does not allow your factor to express that there is a certain sensitivity in your predictive score. So in general, what you want for your factor is that 
high values represent high confidence that you think that the stock is going to go up, and largely negative values are going to represent high confidence that the stock is going to go down, while values very close to zero mean that you don't have a lot of certainty. But having this nice distribution of returns, not returns, but factor scores, is very important because, again, um, it, it allows us to just more flexibly combine these things and, and really uh, do more things with the resulting factor. Um, Rene, anything you want to add to this one? This overview? No, I think that's a great uh, um, introduction to this figures. Yeah. Oh, it's the bases. Okay, so then let's dive into the actual analysis. So the first thing is we just checked that everyone submitted something that is only in the QTE. That's the case here. Then we look at the correlations of returns. And here, a couple of things emerge. One is, so there's this huge cluster over here of very, very highly correlated strategies. And that is uh, something that we're going to talk more about and we will see again. Often, these pockets of highly correlated algorithms come from the same author. And then there's a mention at the beginning. A lot of authors submit iterative versions of the algorithm. And then these will show up here. And then you select only the, the best one of those. But here is now also the case where there's actually many people ending up in the same cluster. So we will talk about that. So um, and the other thing here that we're looking at is the correlation with previous challenges. And one of the reasons is that because the insiders was so difficult, it is quite tempting to over rely on other sources of alpha from other data sets, like the estimates data set. So, and I discussed this in another post where I said, well, okay, so okay. what we want here, what we're asking for in these challenges is for factors to be, quote, pure. And now, with time, I've been able to formal, um, formulate what I mean by that a little bit better than before. And specifically, what I mean is that the intent of the algorithm or the main source of alpha should come from the data set that we're asking you to use, in this case, the insider's transaction challenge. Technically, you could build a multi-factor algorithm, right, that has one insider factor, and you give that a very low weight, and then you mix in a whole bunch of other factors from estimates or whatever data sources, and you get something that looks really, really great, but it defeats the purpose of the challenge, because really, even though insiders is in there somewhere, it's not the main intent of the algorithm. That is not to say that you should not incorporate other data sets. Um, and the, in the forum post that I'm going to link to, I, um, I made the point that you should not use additive combination of different factors. So let's say you have an insiders factor and an estimates factor just simply averaging them together or doing um, an additive combination of the two is not the intent of the challenge. You should not do that. And the reason is that this is not really, there, there's really no ingenuity behind that. There's no insight behind that. Oh, these two factors together just um, harmonize really well with each other. There could be weaknesses that they are balancing out, but nonetheless, it is defeating the purpose of the challenge a little bit, um, as my earlier example demonstrated. Now, however, you can combine them, just not in an additive way. So what that could mean is that you say, well, if my insider factor and my estimates factor both disagree, that, well, that could be really meaningful, right? So then at this point, we're talking about an interaction or a multiplicative effect. And that is an actual insight that you had that different data sources could conspire together to provide information that neither of those alone could provide. And that is highly interesting, right? Because you used an economic rationale, hopefully, that tells you that these two pieces of information from totally different places interact in a certain way, right? 
and that that is predictive. So that is very powerful and there can be true alpha from there. Purely additive combinations will never produce additional alpha. It will only provide diversification benefit. So yes, the factor will look better because you have diversified sources, but the, but it's the same if we were to take these two factors and average them together, right? So um, there's really no benefit to, to us basically when you do this. So um, that is the reason why we here look at the correlation with previous challenges to see how similar certain submissions were to, for example, things from the estimates data set. And you can see that that is actually quite problematic here. And a lot of the, so on the x-axis, we have the correlation with previous challenges. Here's just a histogram. So this cluster over here is totally in the clear. So very low correlation to previous challenges. Everyone here did something very unique, while people over here did something not so unique. So it looks very similar to what we've seen before. And we're going to um, reward with a uniqueness score that Renee developed these on this side of the spectrum. And we'll take that into account in the scoring and downweight those um, on, over here. So that's how we solve that. So now coming back to this clustering that I mentioned in the beginning, here's just the dendrogram. Uh, essentially, you can think of these um, that, are cluster, that are colored here together, all these form a cluster. So we say that if you are um, less than 20% correlated to someone else, then we're going to say, okay, this is a very similar submission, and we're going to treat this as essentially identical. That is a choice that we make. And, um, can argue against that, but um, that's uh, that's what we came up with. And now we can look inside of each of these clusters and look at the authors of them. And most of these show what you would expect that these folks have submitted uh, that these clusters are formed by the same people. So they just submitted multiple times, similar ideas will be fine. And we've seen this in all the submissions. So all of them are, but then this big cluster actually is one that is formed by, so this is one over here, by a lot of different people. And what this tells me, um, of course, I'm just hypothesizing, I can't know it, but um, these are highly correlated from different people. And what this means is that uh, people came up with similar ideas. Now, if, for this data set, that is not surprising just because the things to do were quite limited. So it's not surprising that people tried similar things and there's only a limited number of things that are working in this data set, right? So it's not surprising that uh, there would be some crowding on certain factors. Um, and this is like really strongly expressed here. Again, it's mostly uh, the, the fault of the, of the data set and the limited amount that we were able to make available. But nonetheless, it is, um, yeah. So we see that here from these submissions. And what we decided was also to treat these clusters the same. So we are only going to pick the cluster winner out of that. So that, of course, is going to be um, a high bar to cross over here. But the reasoning behind this is that we also we not only want to reward great factors, but also orthogonal thinking um, or novel ideas. So if there is something that is super obvious to discover, well, obviously, that will be less valuable overall. Right? Um, it will be less valuable to Quantopian or any third party that we want to license this to because, um, well, obvious ideas are easier to be discovered by other people. And this demonstrates this. So these ideas um, were apparently quite easy to discover um, or versions of it. And, um, and that's why it's, it's overall less valuable. And we chose to reward unique ideas, and that's why, um, yeah, there's a, a cluster winner chosen from this one and who will be entering into the contest. Um, Renee, anything you want to add there? 
Mm, yeah, I think that's good. We tested it. Uh, we thought about different ways to find the winners, like uh, not using um, clusters. And uh, I debated with uh, Thomas and discussed it several times. And uh, we think this one is currently um, the best one we can um, find out uh, the balance between the performance and uh, and also the um, uh, uniqueness, I think. Um, so, um, but if you you have some better suggestions, feel free to tell us. Yeah, we will also consider that. Yeah, definitely. That's a good point. We definitely did play around with different schemes, and this one produced the best list. Um, well, the best trade-offs between all kinds of different considerations. So this wasn't an easy decision, and I can see how it could be a contentious issue, too. Especially if you are, if you ended up in that cluster. Um, but well, that's that's the reasoning that went into this, and we didn't come to that decision lightly. Okay, um, moving on. So then Renee came up with this really cool um, way of looking at the stability between the in sampler and the out of sampler. Renee, do you want to um, talk about this one a little bit? Okay, so basically we want to, uh, the, um, the in-sample in performance and in out-sample performance are quite stable. So you can see um, there is a blue line here that is y equals to x. So if you, um, the, the in-sample, um, you can see the x-axis is the in-sample, y-axis is out-of-sample. So this is, if the, uh, we compute the shortest distance, um between the dot and to the blue line so if the dot is on the line that means its ensemble performance is very close to its out of sample performance and we use a um, larger dot to represent if that is uh, more stable and if that is use a very small dot here that means that's not very stable Yep, so the, the size of the dot represents how far away you are from this x equals y line. And um, yeah, so this is the, the, um, the formula that we use to compute this. Um, and I really like this. So we discussed all kinds of different things here as well, like using the, um, the Bayesian cone or other things. But really, the benefit of this, I think, is the simplicity. Um, it just it's, it's easy enough to evaluate. It's um, it's simple. It's quick, and uh, that is always preferred over something that is quite complex to use. And um, so we have two things now that we implicitly explained that will go into the scoring function. One of them is the uniqueness score. That is um, what we see here. So there is a uniqueness score depending on how correlated you are with factors from previous challenges. Uh, then, of course, there's the clustering, and then you know, we select the cluster winners based on the total sharp, uh, the, the sharp ratio over the whole time period. And now here is another thing that goes into the scoring function, which is the distance from the x equals y1. And here, uh, so negative out of samples are coded in gray and positives are coded in green. And just as a meta point, I mean, these results are really interesting because now we have two years of out of sample and we have high confidence that uh, it's difficult to overfit on just because this type period, this time period was not available on the platform. And we can really see the effects of overfitting, um, which is uh, natural because it is probably the biggest difficulty, the, 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 the most difficult challenge in quant finance and machine learning in general is how do you prevent overfitting onto the past? And that is inherently difficult and as demonstrated here, right? So a lot of them fall below the axis and only a few of the factors really manage to hold up between the in and the out of same performance. What is interesting also is that there's sort of a line, um, well, I mean, this is sort of reading tea leaves, but um, we, we allow that there seems to be this line here too, where 
it suggests that maybe there's a shortfall. So let's say if you fit the regression line and uh, maybe it'll fall somewhere here. And that is also makes sense that it's not a yes or no answer whether you overfit or not, but the question is how much. And this line right here would say, okay, well, there's some overfitting going on. It doesn't completely match the in sample performance, but it is still indicative of this. Um, so, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting that there's this cluster, uh, this clustering going on. Uh, but yeah, so this, I think, is a good reminder for everyone that be wary of overfitting. That should be your biggest concern. And be sure to take steps to avoid that. So uh, veterans learn from the expert video discusses that a lot. Um, Kyle makes similar points too. So uh, it's worth checking those out and, and thinking about it. The, I mean, the, the best thing you can do yourself is use a holdout yourself um, when you develop these factors and only move forward if the holdout test um, is it's indicative that you didn't overfit. So yeah, um, a disciplined workflow is really important and the videos highlight that. Okay, cool. So this is this analysis. Uh, next here is a fun little video. So we also ask whether certain authors um, are more prone to overfit than others. So uh, so this is the this is one user, right? He submitted three ones, um, and they all fall quite close to the line. So um, which indicates that this user did. A good job in terms of managing overfitting. There's other examples. So this will just play. And so these, well, they're close, but they're both pretty close to zero. This one also looks really good. So here, kind of the clustering just looks really good. This one seems like it's overfit. This all of these and they're also quite overfit. Yeah, same here. This one is painful. Also some two clusters. Smaller submissions. It's a bit really rough, for example. This one's kind of interesting. Yeah. It seems like fewer submissions, but there could be less of a thing. I don't know. Um, This one is really good. Yeah. So in terms of overall pattern, um, this one probably looks the best. Um, so yeah, so next we, with me, I mean Renee, um, selected the cluster winners as we described before. And then for every cluster winner, we compute the rank or the scoring function that we came up with. In order to do that, we rank according to different metrics, according to the specific out of sample chart ratio, the number of positions, the chart ratio stability. So that is um, what I described before, how Far away are you from the x equal to y line? The turnover and the uniqueness, which is how dissimilar are you from previous challenges? And then we combine these in 
uh, weighted average where we mostly care about the of sample so that is um, yeah the, the biggest determiner and um, position and turnover are also entering into this but more important are the stability and the uniqueness and I really like this uh, weighting that Renee, Renee came up with here so um, yeah that's uh, that's a good one so then with uh, drum roll we can see who scored highest among the scoring function. So these are the the winners. And the first winner is, well, I'm not gonna try to pronounce that and have botch it. So Monk, congratulations, amazing job. Um, Joaquin, good to see you here. Danielle, Magnus, and Jay. So you all won the Insiders Challenge. Congratulations, that is really cool. And what I also really like about this is, well, we have some definitely well-known names like Joaquin, but we also have some new names like Monk, um, Danielle, Magnus, and Jay. So um, it's really great to see that even with a, um, without having done, uh, having won previous challenges, uh, you can still make a dent in, for this data set. Um, so then um, here, Renee colored the, the winners. So yeah, you can see that these are um, pretty good choices considering the overall distribution. You might wonder, for example, well, this one right here, why didn't this algorithm make the cut? The reason is that here, the uniqueness score wasn't high. So it was too similar to um, previous submissions and that's why it didn't make the cut or also the same is true for these over here. Um, so yeah, I'm quite happy with that um, selection. Again, we tried all kinds of different things and decided on, on this. Again, there's trade-offs and we might disagree with certain things, but um, I'm quite happy with, uh, with with this choice of how to do it. And I mean, obviously we will refine this and keep working on it and take your feedback into account. So if you have any, uh, we're certainly interested in hearing that. Um, Renee, anything that you want to add to what I, what I covered so far? No, I think that's good. And also, um, I feel like, uh, um, uh, so we want to emphasize even like uh, you have small sharp ratio, but that is unique and relatively stable. We also like it. You know, we can combine some uh, strategies with just small uh, sharp ratio and we can combine them to build a better one. Um, so we really care about the stability and also um, the uniqueness, whether that is, uh, um, so about the uniqueness, that, what that means is when you, um, like Thomas mentioned, you basically don't want to, um, you have several factors, you don't want to um, just uh, actively combine them together. Um, you can think about some other ideas and submit those uh, ideas separate, separately instead of combining them to um, have a, have just submit one with better performance. You, we suggest you to um, separately submit your ideas. Yeah, that is actually a really great point. So one thing that we can see here is that one of the winners, right, submitted something with a sharp ratio, specific sharp ratio below one, actually two people did. And that is a really good lesson is that uh, just submitting something with an ensemble sharp ratio of say over three right is not um yeah it's not going to be all that valuable if it doesn't hold up out of sample so that is really what it's all about and now with proper, more proper holdout testing as we were able to do here we can really more clearly see that type of behavior and yeah so it's better to submit something with a lower in sample sharp ratio that you think will also carry over into the out of sample rather than something that has an extremely high in sample sharp ratio, which you actually don't believe in. So that's the, that's the core message. Uh, okay, so let's look at the individual tear sheets as I already described. So this is the first place winner, um, Muck. 
And uh, yeah, so I already showed this one uh, in the beginning, probably spoiled that, but anyway. Uh, so yeah, this one, again, it doesn't have the highest sharp ratio, but it's consistent, so that is, that's really good. And also, it's just very co well constructed, um, as you can see. Then your key, this one looks really pristine in many ways. Uh, so really nice decay pattern, very stable returns overall. Um, yeah, it doesn't, not noticeable that there is the out of sample, which starts in 2018, it just keeps going up. So that looks picture perfect. Um, large number of holdings, turnover is in check. And um, the, this distribution also looks a bit noisy, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and, and nice separation between them. So it's not equal weighted. That's the main thing that we're looking for. Then here is Danielle. Also, just really nice, consistent pattern. That's exactly what we're looking for. Also, quite high sharp ratios overall. This is actually also what I like is when there are these exposures, right? Because this tells me, okay, there hasn't really been any work put in to try and hide risk exposures. So the fact that it's short volatility and long size makes me more confident in this factor that uh, it just is completely unconstrained. Um, that's great. And again, holdings, turnover, all look great. This looks great. Um, just another high quality factor. So very deserved winner so far. Then here's Magnus. Um, this one has a more interesting pattern, so it actually seems to increase over a couple of days. Um, sometimes you see that, it, um, not quite sure what to make of it, but um, yeah, it's, that, that's sometimes what it looks like. Uh, but yeah, also not, not the highest sharp ratio overall, but nonetheless, it is consistent. So that's great, and it, and it works out of sample. Um, it's fine, and turnover, is quite spiky on the high side and holdings is lower. So, um, but again, the, um, the objective, the scoring function that we came up with does take that into account. So it's ranked and still did fairly well. Here, um, this is a little bit more unstable, it seems. So that is something to maybe try and investigate why it is so unstable and whether something in the factor that could be done to um, yeah, make that separation a little bit better and smoother. It doesn't have to be a big problem. And then, um, are we still at the winners? Jay, I think is the last one, right? Yeah, okay, Jess. Jay is the uh, fifth winner. And that's what that factor looks like. So also, um, quite typical decay pattern, looks great overall. Also, there's a drawdown here towards the end of 2019, which is very, mm, well, we all know that 2019 was difficult. Uh, Renee, can you mute yourself? Um, uh, I'm going to take them off. Okay. There's just their silence in your background. Um, Okay, and so, yeah, this might be the quant um, struggles of 2019 that um, we're seeing here, but nonetheless, over the whole time period, it's still up in the out of sample. And as we saw, that is not an easy thing to accomplish. So really cool. And then here, um, it has a small universe and um, it's quite heavy on the turnover. And this, of course, looks really well separated. So uh, probably some transform that was maybe applied here, but um, it's cool. So now we have some additional um, honorary mentions that didn't receive a prize, but nonetheless are next in the ranking. So this is Andy and um, yeah, ha this is interesting. It has a much higher specific sharp ratio than total sharp ratio. And then you can see that here. So, um, I would expect that there are some exposures that are influencing that, like a short momentum exposure, which is hurting the total returns, but 
again, that's that's fine. Um, and, and that is something that is easy to handle for us on our end. When we combine this, it will probably go away or, or we just constrain it ourselves, right? But there's no reason for you to constrain. Um, and again, here, this one has a large universe, which is great. And, um, and turnover is also more the high side, but um, yeah, it's so definitely spiky. Uh, Radian also looks great. Um, struggles it seems somewhat flat in the out of sample, um, but nonetheless, actually pretty, pretty good. Um, day force, I mentioned. So here we see this pattern. That, so first of all, the number of holdings isn't as high, and the 25th and 75th percentile is very close to zero. So that means it's much dominated by just the, the largest values. Or another way to say this, it's fairly close to equal rate. Um, and this suggests that maybe uh, there was indeed the optimizer being used. And yes, um, I think that's the 10th um, the place. Um, so here is an example of where it does turn negative. So if you imagine this, that you incurred trading delay of nine days or eight days, uh, you actually expect negative alpha to be contributed to portfolio, which you don't want, but being positive over the first five days is really what we care about most, so that's fine. Um, and then I think this is the last one. Yeah, so here we can see um, a that something is wrong here with the factor construction. So um, yeah, this block it doesn't make doesn't make any sense to me. So something is something is up um, with the, with the weight distribution. So um, yeah, I invite the author to look more closely into why there's such high um, change between the quantiles that they're jumping around. It seems like the scores all turn negative at a certain point. Otherwise, the ninety fifth percentile wouldn't wouldn't go down. So um, yeah, it seems like the fact is really just jumping between longs and shorts and it's not long short balance equally. And then also the turnover spikes into like 200%, which is way too high. Um, but so that should just be motivation to improve these things. I mean, these are things that are quite easy to manage once you see them and understand them. So um, definitely reach out if you have any questions on that. But, Overall, we appreciate everyone's um, submissions. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about learning here. So, um, so it's all good. And finally, the combined factor. Uh, again, this is based on insider's data, so it's not going to be as impressive as before. But nonetheless, anything that is diversified will be contributing to the overall portfolio, wherever it ends up. And here we have the, um, yeah, just so it's not as high as, like, say, the estimates one, which I think was even at four or something. But nonetheless, you can see, like, even for a low alpha data set like Insiders, at least to the extent that it was available on Quantopium at this time, you um, get something that overall looks quite good if you combine the top five factors. The fact that it, well, that it goes up in the out of sample is not surprising because we, se we selected it based on the out of sample. So the out of sample is not, is invalidated here. Um, and we would need an additional out of sample to say that our selection is not overfitting in any way. So that um, is just one caveat here to point that out. Um, yeah, and we can see that the exposures average out, like they tend to do, and also we get really big universe, nice distribution of weights, uh, and the turnover is more on the high side, but um, that's, that's fine for this um, the exercise and there's different ways to slow this down. Now, especially because the alpha is quite stable. So you could introduce a moving average and slow the factor down um, and, and push further into this territory over here where um, and reduce the turnover that way. So that, I think, is everything. Uh, Renee, is there anything that you'd like to add?
No, that's good. Cool. Um, so I think then if, um, are there any questions, Sally? Yeah, there are a few questions. Um, so now we are transitioning to the Q&A section of the webinar. Um, and I will just ask them. And Renee and Thomas, uh, you guys feel free to take them in whatever format, whichever person wants to answer them. So first question is, poor performance during the holdout period is a necessary, necessarily due to overfitting, though, right? Yes, thanks for pointing that out. Um, that's that's correct. So it could be changing market regimes. Um, no factor works across all time. Um, so yes, that is true. I would nonetheless argue that, I mean, the longer the holdout period, the less uh, believable that other explanations become, right? So if you say, well, I have a five-year backtest and five-year holdout, and it works has a sharp range of two over the in sample and then uh, zero over the five year holdout. Well, I, I don't think that there the most plausible explanation is that it is overfit. So, two years is a good time period, and there are definitely some, some changes in the market, definitely the volatility. So, um, yeah, I would say that it's not the only explanation. There could be contributing factors, but given everything I've seen, I would say it's the most likely. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And also, um, we do consider that uh, scenario. So we have, um, when we choose the winners from the clusters, we use the overall performance instead of just out of sample performance. So we do consider both in sample and out of sample. And also from, um, the stability. I mean, even you, it an algo has a very bad in sample and also very bad out sample, unless they are quite close. From the stability part, it could still like a, get a very high ranked score, right? So, um, uh, in general, I think um, we do consider that consider that scenario and. Uh, Included in it, uh, included in our scoring system. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, the next question is, um, and I'm not sure if this is something that you want to or can answer. Um, who submitted the highest blue dot on the blue line? Um, I just. Thomas, do you think we can disclose it? It's one to disclose it. Um, sure. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> I think that if you're unsure, we can. No, no. That's uh, yeah. No, I mean it's fine. Um, so that was Andy, right? That's Daniel, I think. <laughs> what? Who was that? Um, I think it, the question is asked. Uh, so who who submitted this one right here, right? No. Is that right? Blue dot on blue line. So in the winners. This one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, who was that? I mean, it's totally fine to suppose that. Um, Do you know? I, um, we, 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 we can double check, but uh, I thought that is uh, Daniel Carabini. Cool. Oh. Um, yeah, if, if that's wrong, we can um, correct it later. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll trust you on that. Um, the not... clarification for that question is of the winners, and then this person reckons that it's Daniel. Yeah. Um, well, actually, we can look here, right? Um, so total rank. Oh, these two actually rank exactly the same. That's interesting. Um, Shopper's stability rank is two, so that is likely, yes. And then the of sample rank is also two. Um, it got hammered on the uniqueness rank. Um, yeah, so that is um, correct then.
Um, the last question that we have, um, and people should submit their questions um, if they have any remaining ones, um, is what happens to the efficiency frontier if more outlier portfolios are used over time? Um, I don't understand the question, Rene, do you? No, I don't understand what is outlier portfolios. Yeah, so, so yeah, two things I, I don't understand. One is efficient frontier, which makes it sound like there would be like the, um, what's that stuff called? Um, uh, well, you mean, mean variance optimization, right? And mm -hmm. you optimize beyond the efficient frontier. So this looks a bit similar. Oh, okay. Well, um, okay. So if you, oh, hmm, interesting. I haven't thought about this. So these are the factors, right? But this is not the, yeah. So this isn't plotting the, um, if this were plotting the mean and the volatility, right? Then I think you'd get the efficient frontier, right? Uh, but this is in sample, out of sample. So it's a, it's a bit of a different plot. I might be confused what the intent of the question is, but, um, oh, okay, no, I think I understand. Can you read the question again? Yep. Uh, so the question asks, um, what happens to the efficiency frontier if more outlier portfolios are used over time? No, yeah, um, I don't quite know. I don't quite get the intent of the question. It seems a bit, um, yeah, I, don't, I also don't see how it relates. So um, I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad question. So please follow up. Um, you can write me at tweaky at quantopen.com um, and I'll be happy to discuss that more. But um, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't quite, mm -mm, can't do it justice. Um, the last question asks, is the code available to download? And I think that they are referring to the code that you are using to analyze. Uh, um, it's not. And, um, you could, it, and we, we won't make it available just because there's a lot of um, code that is, I mean, it's not that we want to keep this code secret because I'm just showing it here, right? So you could just extract it yourself. Um, but a lot of the data loaders and whatnot are internal to us so it wouldn't be useful you wouldn't be able to run it but um, at the same time if you want to like really understand the details or you just want to learn from the analysis like clustering i mean i don't see a good good reason not to so um we could so maybe just also well i'd probably be more comfortable if people would email me and ask about the notebook and then we can we can send it if you if you tell us what you want to do with it but yeah, overall, I don't, I, don't, I don't see why, I don't see good reason why not. But we won't post it publicly. Cool. Well, um, if that is all the questions, then uh, thank everyone so much for tuning in and for submitting for the Insider Challenge. Our other challenge with the pension fund, the third party one is well underway and is getting more submissions and entries than ever before, which is amazing. And people are submitting really high quality factors. So yeah, um, we hope that this was instructive. And um, again, congrats to the winners who did an outstanding job. I mean, these are really tough competitions and um, and this data set specifically was very difficult. So uh, thank you, yeah. Thank you everybody for watching and thank you to Thomas and Renee for presenting a great webinar. Have a great day, everyone.